Greetings to you all, wherever you're participating in this webinar. I am Nick Stern uh, from the London School of Economics, and I'm wel welcoming you as past president of the Royal Economic Society. I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Royal Economic Society who are running this series of webinars. And in particular, we have a sub-series of three, of three webinars this week organized by um, the Grantham Research Institute at the London School of Economics. And these three this week are on a strong and building a strong and sustainable recovery. And we um, have divided that into three strategies and investments we had last Monday. What are the investments and the strategies for those investments necessary for a strong and sustainable recovery? Today, we're talking about policy for a strong and sustainable recovery and finance. So could I have the uh, first slide, please? So this slide outlines the structure of the series this week, the three parts, and I've already described strategy, policy, and finance. The uh, overarching set of objectives, if we're referring to the UK as our articulated by the government, uh, leveling up, net zero, productivity, um, investing in infrastructure, and building a, a global Britain. So those are overarching UK objectives, but the strong and uh, sustainable recovery is a story that of course is relevant for all countries uh, in the world. So we hope that what is said here is relevant um, way beyond uh, the UK. Last Monday, we had some very powerful messages. First and foremost, the scale of this crisis is truly global and bigger than anything we have seen. The crisis 2008-10 was largely financial sector of rich countries with knock-on effects. This crisis is everywhere. It affects developing countries, particularly severely given weak health and social security systems, but also because they see falling uh, commodity prices, falling remittances, and capital flight. So this is a truly global crisis, and it will need a strong response from all countries and from all countries uh, taken together. That um, strong action will be about, uh, in large measure, investment and employment, or investment, innovation, and employment. And we saw last Monday that the key areas of physical capital and uh, natural capital and human capital could be very powerful if oriented in a sustainable way. Examples, uh, powerful in the sense that they could be quick in creating employment, they uh, could be labor intensive, so they create a lot of employment, and they have potentially very big uh, Keynesian multipliers and indeed supply side multipliers as well. Examples were the quick action to improve uh, cities for pedestrians and uh, for cycles, retrofitting buildings, charging for electric vehicles, natural capital investment in trees, land, water and uh, so on, and of course investment in human capital. There'll be a lot of unemployment a lot, a lot of young people without jobs, a moment for investing in human capital. And of course, in that context, social cohesion or social capital will be uh, very important. So that was the story that came from uh, last Monday. Today, we're going to focus on the policies that can drive through that investment. So before I hand over to our first speaker, let me introduce those speakers because they'll just be handing over one to the other. Um, Adair Turner, Ray Newton-Smith and Steve Machin, their affiliations are on their uh, first uh, slides. The discussion will be moderated by Tara Alice, who is the Director of Research and Economics at McKinsey. And uh, the leading that discussion will be Andres Velasco, Dean of the School of Public Policy in LSE, and Diane Coyle, Director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at uh, University of um, Cambridge. A lot of organizations gone into this. I'd like to thank Sam Unsworth for leading the uh, overall uh, activity splendidly at the uh, LSE. Uh, 
Dimitri Zengales, Anna Valero, Nick Robbins, who have organized the individual uh, seminars, Anna Valero, this one on uh, policy, to Leighton, Brad and Julia at the Royal Economic Society and all there, and my fellow presidents, uh, they're numerous in the Royal Economic Society, Tim Besley, Rachel Griffith, Carol Proper, and it's the four of us together who've tried to put this whole big RES series into place. So thank you again for joining us. Over to you, Adair. Good. I think I have to start again. Uh, thank you, Nick. It's a great pleasure to join uh, this Royal Economic Society uh, seminar. Um, could I have the first uh, slide on the next page, please? To identify the policies needed to drive a sustainable recovery, I think it's useful to consider how the crisis has changed the conditions to which policy must respond. And in both capital markets and labour markets, I will suggest what we will see is an intensification of structural trends already in place. While in the energy markets, the fossil fuel prices, the structural trend is less clear and the danger instead that short-term developments could undermine required structural direction. Can I have the next slide, please? To begin with capital markets, this slide shows the real yield to maturity on a 10-year indexed UK gilt averaged over five-year periods from 1986 to 2015, and then the year-by-year -year figures for the last five years. And what we can see is a dramatic fall in the real risk-free interest rate from plus 4% in the late 1980s to less than minus 2% uh, by 2019, and with the crisis provoking a further downward shift. Along with Larry Summers and others, I believe that this reflects a fundamental change in the balance between ex-ante desired aggregate savings and ex-ante intended required private investment, which together have hugely reduced the equilibrium real interest rate, which will arise from purely private savings and investment decisions. Inequality and demography, among other factors, have increased desired savings rates, while the collapsing cost of information technology, hardware and software have reduced required investment in many private companies. The crisis, I think, will almost certainly intensify these effects, with private investment at least for a time depressed by confidence effects and precautionary savings likely to rise in an uncertain world. And as a result, the medium term outlook is for continued very low or negative real uh, risk free interest rates. But in many cases, that will be combined with very high risk premia for companies, projects or countries which are perceived as risky. And in that environment, increased investment in socially environmentally desirable projects would be both cheap and macroeconomically useful. And governments have a major ability to reduce the risks of perceived, the perceived risks of capital projects. If I can move on to the next chart, as for labor markets, here I think we will surely see accelerated automation wherever it is technically feasible. The pace of automation, of course, depends not only on technical feasibility, but on the relative cost of capital equipment versus labor. But this crisis has produced a very significant upward shock in the cost of employing labor. Social distancing protocols in factories and shops and the need to monitor worker health will add significantly to employment costs. But you can continue to pack robots as closely together as before and they don't get sick. As a result, across the world, I think there will be an intensified focus on how to substitute capital for labor. Some manufacturing companies are already looking at how to achieve within a year automation progress previously planned for five. Online retailing is flourishing while bricks and uh, mortar retailing collapses. And within distribution, highly automated operations are gaining share relative to those which you use labor intensive processes. I also think that the environment of remote working will provoke a intense analysis of the possibilities for robotic process automation, 
As for horticulture, fruit and vegetable picking robots until now look too expensive relative to cheap migrant labor, but their deployment will now accelerate with major implications for migrant labor remittance flows back to home countries. Now, of course, automation has been going on for decades, but we still entered this crisis with close to record employment rates. And that was because until now, automation driven job disruption in subsectors has been fully matched by relentless growth in what one might call tactile, face to face, difficult to automate services in hospitality, in leisure, and in multiple forms of personal service. But what we now face, I think, is an accelerated automation in the automatable sectors at the very moment where the job creation machine of tactile services has been temporarily shut down. We have more robotized factories alongside shuttered restaurants and pubs. Next slide, please. Finally, on fossil fuel prices, oil has fallen 60%, gas 40%, coal 20%. But here I think the medium trend term trend is less clear. Let's remember that the oil price collapsed after the global financial crisis, but was back above $100 by 2011. But even if this price fall lasts only a few years, this still threatens the pace of the required energy transition, with low gas prices undermining the apparent short-term economics of renewables investment, and with low petrol prices delaying the date at which electric vehicles are definitively cheaper than internal combustion engines. So next slide, please. What follows from that analysis for the policies to drive sustainable recovery? Let me suggest five. First, we should accelerate investment in renewable energy and in other green infrastructure. And in developed countries, that primarily means simply by policies which reduce private investment risk, because as long as you reduce the risk enough, there is a wall of capital willing to invest for relatively small yield uplifts against these very low real interest rates. If countries bring forward massive a quantity auctions for wind and solar, they will see ferociously low prices bid in those auctions. In developing countries, however, where there are significant risk premia on the basis of country risk, I think the role of development banks is even more important than before. Second, we need a strong focus on job intensive green investments and the crucial area there is probably building refurbishment and energy efficiency improvement. Some of the renewable energy areas are not all that job intensive, but restoring the improving the energy efficiency of existing buildings is very job intensive as to our multiple forms of ecosystem restoration. Third, and I know that Rain will talk about this, I think we need to support key technological developments, for instance, in batteries and hydrogen related technologies to ensure that the great progress that is being achieved there is not slowed down by this experience of low fossil fuel prices. Fourth, I think we should make support for specific industries or, com or companies contingent on commitments to green development. Fifth, and really vitally, we must speed progress towards significant carbon prices. Recognizing that even if today's low fossil fuel prices might be reversed in a few years time, the long-term trend will have to be down if we actually make progress towards a zero carbon economy. If in 2050, we consume only 10 million barrels a day versus today's 100 million barrels a day, the marginal cost of production of that 10th million barrel will probably be about eight to 10 dollars. So if we don't have a carbon price on top, lower cost oil will always look very attractive. So however difficult the politics, we must try to use the opportunity of low fossil fuel prices to accelerate carbon pricing and the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. subsidies. Otherwise, we will slow progress towards a zero carbon economy. Let me end next slide with just a page with two references, uh, one academic article, and also uh, the statement put out by the Energy Transitions Commission with more detail on these policy proposals that I have recommended. And let me now hand over to Rain. Excellent. Um, 
Thanks very much, uh, Adair. I think as we think about the critical role of innovation policy in, in driving a more sustainable uh, economy, really picking up where Adair uh, left off, we need to reflect on the context of where businesses are now in the COVID crisis. Next slide, please. As Chief Economist at the CBI, I speak with businesses across all sectors and regions and size, sizes in the UK. And also our regular surveys shed light on some of the issues that businesses have been facing. And what we know is that in the past few weeks, over four in 10 businesses have at any one point had to completely shut down their operations entirely in the UK. And there's been so many challenges that businesses have been facing. Their biggest concern, of course, is for the well-being of their staff. But I think what's clear is one of their biggest challenges is in managing cash flow with eight out of 10 businesses facing challenges around their cash flow. Next slide, please. The aim of policy so far has been, as Andrew Bailey and Alex Brazier and others at the Bank of England have articulated, is to build a bridge for businesses to the other side of this crisis. Because unlike the global financial crisis, there were no obvious bubbles to correct or asset price distortions, but rather what we've seen is a global health crisis that has unfolded and rippled through the world economy. Next slide, please. So the aim has been to help businesses survive, primarily through loans, through the banking system, and also tax deferrals, and some grants for some of the, the hardest hit small businesses in retail and on our high streets. But secondly, and probably arguably the most important aim of the economic policy response has been to protect jobs and livelihoods primarily through the job retention scheme. And I have to say, as an aside, the agility, the innovation, and the speed at which teams across different government departments have worked together to deliver these policies has been truly amazing and impressive. And the way that they have listened to businesses and also unions to help deliver it has been great. And I hope that's one of the innovations we can carry forward with us into the next phase. And so we've seen the JRS supporting over seven and a half million jobs or around one third of the private sector workforce. And I think what we've seen so far is policy has absolutely been aimed at preserving the economy in a static form. But as we look to this next phase, we want to focus on a dynamic, innovative and productive economy with sustainability at its heart. And so we'll need a new set of policies which build on these and build on some of the long-standing challenges. Next slide, please. So I think one of the things we have to reflect on is what we've learned uh, so far through the, the crisis. And what I'm certainly finding from businesses and from policymakers is we're all now trying to focus on how we build back better. What sort of economy do we want to build? How do we learn? from this experience and how do we take the best of that forward? So we've certainly seen the focus on clean air, on green spaces, on livable cities and communities. Things that Andy Haldane, in, as he talks about social capital, has articulated and Diana Coyle and others have reminded us about the importance of green capital uh, in all of our lives. And I think we're also seeing fundamental changes in where we can and where we want to work, whether that's from home. And I think one of the things we're absolutely saying is a leapfrog forward in terms of the adoption of digital technologies, communication platforms, cloud storage, and CRM and how that all links together. And the picture in the top right hand corner also shows one of the areas where we've seen that the UK is particularly strong in terms of our capability. It's a picture of the Jenner Institute at Oxford University, just a few miles uh, from my home, uh, where some of my friends are working on the vaccine that is being developed and trialed there. And it absolutely reflects our global advantage in medical research and biotech. But I think we've also learned where some of our capability is weaker. 
in testing and in some areas of manufacturing. So as we think about how we build back better, we need to think about our capability in critical areas. And it also shines a light on the UK, how our natural strength has always been around research, but we found it harder in some cases to ensure the development happens in all cases around here in the UK. But next slide, please. But before we focus on innovation policy, I just want to have a small thought to what kind of economy we want to build and how we want that to work around the UK. And we all know as economists that productivity absolutely matters. But one thing I'd highlight is its correlation with happiness and well-being is at the regional level is more complicated than it might appear. We know that in London and the Southeast, productivity is high and innovation and networks um, that rely on it are higher, but actually measures of happiness and well-being are lower. So I think we need to keep bear that in mind as we develop our innovation policy. And it's right to naturally focus it on the grand challenges of clean growth, mobility, and how we move around the country. Next slide. So one of the things is how do we develop our innovation policy to develop to, to end up with the economy that we'd like to see? And I think we know some of the long-standing challenges in the UK. Business investment as a share of GDP is low relative to our peers. So is R&D. And this government and, and the previous ones have had a real focus on raising R&D investment. And we also know that we have many of the frontier firms in the UK, but the diffusion of that te technology to all businesses has traditionally been weak in the UK, as Andy Haldane and John Van Rienen and others has, have articulated it. And at the CBI, we call it, how can we move from being ostriches with our head in the sand to magpies where we steal the best ideas? And so increasing that innovation adoption is so important. So how do we do it? Well, our R&D tax credit has been hugely successful. We probably need to expand that with the way innovation is changing around data and upskilling and retraining of staff. We need to think about how we can use this crisis to leapfrog some of that digital adoption and the role of be the business. And we absolutely need to think about the complementarity of investment and skills. Um, and of course, it's certainly shown us the, the network capability of increasing super fast broadband to homes and businesses. Next slide, please. And to, I'm, to my mind, I'm very much building on what Adair was saying. While demand is weak and as we look to rebuild our capability, it is a real opportunity to bring forward the green investment we all want to see. How we think about how we build our homes and offices and how we retrofit our existing homes how we move around the country and the opportunity there is at the moment with low oil prices on carbon pricing and how we can invest in some of the technologies which will help to deliver this low carbon future from clean hydrogen production to carbon capture usage and storage. Next slide, please. And I think we've seen many of those principles set out both through the UK Committee on Climate Change and in our report earlier in November, which we called the decade of delivery. So I think to bring that all together, as we think about how we build back better, we need to be supporting technologies, not sectors. We need to think about how our innovation policy and more broadly, how we build capabilities in areas where we don't have it and how we focus on our grand challenges, but not picking individual winners or companies. And also how we think about the finance landscape to deliver that and the depth of the capital markets that we need to really drive the digital adoption we need. But finally, I would say particularly to an audience primarily of economists, we need to think about how we measure policy success. And we should be giving as much emphasis to how we measure things like our carbon emissions, both in our domestic production, but also in our consumption, as we do to GDP. And think of wider measures of air quality, natural capital, happiness and well-being, and use that to prioritize the infrastructure products 
uh, projects we want to see. And finally, we must absolutely recognise that investment in physical capital needs to go hand in hand with investment in human capital. And it's only when we properly rethink lifelong learning and how the two complement each other that we can really create the economy we want to see. And with that, I will hold, hand over to Steve, who will really take us through the importance of, re, of building up human capital. Okay, thank you, Ryan. And, and I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk and for setting up this, this very important series of, of talks here. Um, so I'm going to use my time to uh, talk specifically about uh, policies on the labour market and on skills and education. And it will be based upon uh, what we know from research about the impact of previous recessions, but also trying to recognise that there was set a large number of differences in this downturn from earlier ones. And that these differences both now and looking forward are vital to, um, to trying to generate an understanding on how we might design policies uh, to offset some of the problems we're already facing and are going to be facing in the future. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so just very quickly on the situation, uh, we know that labor markets have, have taken a big hit already um, and are gonna to continue to take a big hit, uh, perhaps with longer run consequences from the lockdown that's occurred. Many firms experience big negative demand shocks. Uh, the self-employed are getting much less work, facing big income losses. And it seems pretty clear that transitions back to work and future job loss that's going to occur uh, is going to involve reallocation across sectors. And these are likely to be pretty uneven and uh, much more marked than in previous recessions. And we can already see that happening right now. There's also disruptions to education that are not separate to what's going on in the labour market. There's a strong interaction between what's going on in, in education and the labour market. Uh, and one big thing seems to be that these disruptions have occurred with school closures and disadvantaged pupils are falling behind. So I think the bottom line is that immediate and longer term policy responses are required. And that's what I want to talk about uh, in my presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so from what we know, uh, there's been uh, already, uh, inequality is already rising on several dimensions, uh, both in terms of labour market and in terms of education. Uh, so, you know, we've seen a huge number of, of new applications for universal credit. We've got one in four workers uh, being furloughed on, under the job retention scheme. Uh, but there's quite a lot of uh, variation in who's being hit harder and who's being hit less. Uh, so from the surveys that have been carried out um, so far, uh, we've seen that there's, um, the people who are losing out in terms of job or earnings losses uh, disproportionately are the young, uh, those in low paid jobs and uh, women. Uh, consumer spending has also been falling significantly, but again, not in a uniform way across goods and services and across different uh, demographic groups. Uh, so in, in some sense, what's been happening is uh, there's actually been a forced saving amongst richer people. Uh, who, are, who are doing better actually in some sense uh, and the, the low paid are doing worse and so both earnings and in, income inequality are already rising. Um, on the education side of things school closures are exacerbating already existing gaps, uh, achievement gaps between students from different backgrounds uh, and so educational inequalities are also rising. So we've seen both income and, and, and education inequality already rising uh, in, in terms of uh, short term uh, start of things. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, of course, if you want to think about longer run consequences, the twin routes to lower social mobility in the future are greater income and educational inequality. And that's precisely what's happening. So we really have to be very, very careful about what's going on. And the role for policy to try and alleviate these kind of problems is very significant. Uh, the longer term effect may be worse if there's scarring effects for individuals' earnings and job prospects, and if the scarring effects on pupils' education outcomes. Uh, we know there's a big literature out there on learning loss that happens in the summer um, for disadvantaged children. It's exactly what's going on now as well. Um, so we need policies to counter these inequalities that drive low social mobility and perhaps could, could result in longer run scars um, occurring. So it seems that the most the short term priority really has to be to protect the most immediately vulnerable in the labour market and in the education system. But we also have to think about the longer run here. 
uh, in terms of making sure that longer term scarring effects, both education scarring and unemployment scarring, um, don't occur. And the critical thing here would be to consider how a transition of, un of the unemployed into particular sorts of new, sort new forms of jobs. And I was very pleased to hear there Anne Rain saying about sustainable jobs here. And there's a very good opportunity here for to, to, to push forward that kind of agenda. Um, so in terms of new jobs, investments required to meet net zero will create employment opportunities even in the short term. And this is something we should be really thinking about in terms of policy design. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so on, on to actual policies that, that I think are potentially, um, potentially important. Uh, first on labor markets and the second, next, the, the final slide I'll have uh, will be on education as well. But as I said before, these are not um, separate things. Of course, they are interlinked. In, in various um, critical ways. So I think we need to think about how the uh, job retention scheme, the furloughing measures are going to be phased down and what policies would be associated with in, in, in terms of restructuring these and what's going to be important when this comes. So the critical thing has to be to make sure that long-term unemployment is not going to arise again. We've seen this before in the past and from previous recessions, uh, it, it imposes huge costs uh, on individuals, not just economic costs, psychological costs, uh, well-being costs as well. We need to make sure that long-term unemployment does not return. So what does that mean for the phasing down of the furlough measures? Uh, well, one thing I think is it's going to have to be important for part-time work and short-term working measures uh, to be included, included in this. Uh, and that was, that was a very welcome thing that was um, raised in terms of the, the measures that have been extended to October. Uh, in terms of uh, what, the, what the government announced. I also think we need to be thinking very seriously about the scope for job guarantees if people are on trajectories towards longer term uh, or longer duration unemployment. So a job guarantee at six or 12 months uh, would seem very important. And I think this is actually an opportunity again on the sustainability side of things. If you can guarantee employment in many potential jobs that could be productive from that point of view, that would seem to be a really important thing to make sure that, that the people are not scarred by longer term, uh, not, not scarred in, in, in the longer term by having uh, long unemployment spells, which we know are very, very bad uh, for economic and social outcomes. Um, I mentioned at the start that the, this downturn is different from other ones because we basically had a, an entire shutdown of some sectors and, and, and not others. Um, and so this, this obviously means that uh, there's a large number of people who will either be have the potential to go back into the jobs they were already working on before the shutdown, but some of those jobs won't be feasible for the future. And so we've got to think about what happens to people who are displaced and, and maybe will be looking for work in other sectors or occupations. So again, to echo uh, the two previous speakers, reskilling and training the workforce are going to be very, very important. In that. And we need to think uh, in a newer way, I think, than has been done in the past about how how this can be done in an effective manner. Um, uh, so we know, as Rain mentioned, uh, that physical capital, investments in physical capital and human capital in the past have not been treated symmetrically uh, in any way at all in, in, the, in, in the tax system. We, we mentioned this in our LSE Growth Commission report in 2017 and spoke about thinking about creative ways to think about human capital tax credits uh, in, 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 in some kind of way. And I think this is probably the time for this to be thought of in a creative way uh, in, in terms of, again, um, the shutting the uh, uh, We've got the apprenticeship levy, uh, which is a subsidy to employers for apprenticeships. It seems to me that from a vocational education point of view, a lifelong learning levy, levy which would be broader than the apprenticeship levy as a mean of restructuring, would also be a good way of thinking of it. Perhaps in, in, in interaction with the job guarantee as well. Because after all, if you think about it, in for all sense and purposes, then the furlough is actually a, a job guarantee that people think with their, with their wages currently being paid by, paid by the government uh, as well. And then we need better information. The spatial dimension is very important. We need better information on skill supply and demand at the local level to inform individual choices so that we can get a better match between education training providers and, and employers. That's been a long-standing issue in the UK labour market uh, with skill mismatch between, uh, between, uh, between workers and, 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 and uh, firms. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Then on the education side of things, uh, we need to think about how education inequalities can be uh, minimised. 
uh, and learning losses that differentially affect disadvantaged children uh, can, can be offset uh, in, in some kind of way. Uh, so what, one thing we know, especially in some of the social mobility research I've been involved with, uh, is that actually one means by which advantaged children do much better is they have much more planned in the way of uh, private tutoring uh, and, and uh, more disadvantaged children don't. This would, it would seem that a national tutoring service might well be something that, 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 that could be thought of as an education policy that could be useful for offsetting um, gaps between advantaged and disadvantaged children. Uh, shortening the summer holidays is a possibility and actually extending the pupil premium perhaps to pay for the extra tutor tutoring would be a good idea uh, with extra grants allocated to parts of the country that would need it most. Um, so uh, to conclude, actually can we just go to the next slide as well please, which just gives some, uh, a bunch of references for anybody who might be interested in, in, in reading, uh, reading more widely on this. So just to conclude, it seems to me that retraining schemes, wage subsidies, job guarantees and tax incentives for human capital should all be in the mix uh, in terms of how, how one might design policies uh, to counter the inequalities that are already occurring and may well have long lasting effects if they're not addressed in terms of human capital, natural capital and social capital. I think it's important to note that the labour market and education inequalities are inter intertwined, they're not separate things. And you think of, for example, childcare implications of return to work and school reopenings, which face many families. Uh, they combine uh, badly if, if both those inequalities arise in, in terms of future social mobility. So we, whilst we definitely need immediate short run policies, we have to think in, in terms of um, longer run negative outcomes and think about how policy can be, be implemented to make sure uh, that we don't have long run, longer run negative outcomes that might occur. Um, and so on that, I shall finish, and I will hand over to Tara, who will guide the, dis the discussion stage. Thank you. Right, try again. Now I should be unmuted. Thank you very much um, to all of you um, who've already spoken. Thank you to Steve for handing over a very rich um, and very insightful set of presentations and observations. I wanted to add just um, two things uh, before I hand over to our first respondent, Andres. Um, the first one is just to highlight both the point that Steve and Rain made around making sure that we don't just focus on productivity and the economic metrics, but also broader well-being metrics. And Steve's points about this crisis hitting um, the least well-off or the most vulnerable the most is really critical. And really just two points on that. Our analysis suggests that maybe about 24% or a quarter of the UK workforce is at risk of, um, of losses due to the COVID epidemic. Um, but when you look at that for young women, the number actually goes up to 44%. Or if you look at it for lone parents, the number goes up to 30%. So really we need to be making sure that the crisis response and the recovery and building for better in the future also very much focuses on limiting those inequalities. Um, Rain and um, Adair both emphasized the massive opportunity we now have to move to a much more lower carbon economy um, and we should make the most of it. There are many, many jobs that can be created in that low or zero carbon trajectory. But let's not forget the fact that a lot of those will be jobs created for men. Uh, and we need to equally be creating um, some jobs for women. And perhaps that brings me to my other point, which is around the emphasis on human capital. Um, it would be amazing if, just in the way that Adair was talking about reducing the risks of physical investment, if governments could figure out ways in which to reduce the investment risk in investing into human capital, training, upskilling, and in particular digital skills here in the UK. Um, we know by, that by 2030, something like 25 million in the workforce will not have the necessary basic digital skills to actually do their jobs very well and have a thriving um, career. And similarly, 
we've done some very early analysis, and I have to emphasize correlation does not mean causation, but it appears that those countries in the COVID crisis that have seen the least drop in their well-being or their life satisfaction have been those countries where people were already highly digitally skilled and digitally enabled. And so now is the opportunity to actually put some of the investment that we want to put into the recovery into also tackling some of those more softer issues. But let me now hand over to Andres as our first respondent. Um, and then Diane will speak and then we'll come back to the questions from you. Thank you very much, Tara. Thanks to Nick Stern and to the Royal Economic Society for putting this together and for inviting me to join in. Uh, much of the discussion on the COVID crisis and the response suffers from confirmation bias. People simply see in the crisis the confirmation of whatever they predicted earlier. So by contrast, it is wonderful and refreshing to be part of a conversation that is analytically minded, data-driven, and very policy-oriented. Given how little time we have, I want to uh, focus basically on one issue, jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, if you've been reading Paul Krugman's columns uh, lately, he makes the point that recoveries after recessions in the 70s, early and part of the 90s, typically tended to involve very fast employment growth. Uh, last time around in the recovery from the crisis a decade ago, employment never really recovered. And there's a big risk, of course, that this time around, for all the reasons that the previous speakers have emphasized, we will have very little job creation, an increase in inequality, and a real dip in welfare and well-being. Or put differently, you know, in the UK and many other countries, governments have spent a lot of effort and a lot of money in these successful job retention schemes, which are predicated on the notion that you keep somebody on the job for six months, then the economy picks up and we all go back to normal. The real risk, of course, is that the economy will not pick up or because of technological changes, changes in demand, changes in preferences, those jobs simply will not be there. And at the very beginning, I think Adair gave us a framework to think about this, which I find both clarifying and terrifying. He said, look, we are in a world in which for the secular stagnation reasons that Larry Summers and others have explained, the real rate of interest, that is to say the cost of capital, is going to be very, very low for a long period of time. On the other hand, the productivity of labor has gone down. A waiter in a restaurant is less productive if you have to keep two meters between one table and the next. And the cost of employing labor has gone up, not because the wages have gone up, but simply because of protective equipment, social distancing measures, all kinds of um, additional care that has to be taken, et cetera. So capital is cheap, labor is expensive, labor is less productive. The real risk is that we will see a gigantic shift, and several of the speakers said it, away from labor demand toward capital demand, low employment, low, you know, wages that stagnate, higher inequality, et cetera. What do we do about it? many things and uh, the speakers outlined several policies i just want to emphasize two kinds of policies and also explain express some um, risks doubts and reservations the first thing we need to do is of course to make sure that labor is priced right if the relative price of labor is going up how do we keep that from destroying jobs and i think um Steve, at the very end, mentioned uh, a number of policies that are going to be very key. He talked about job guarantees, apprenticeship levies, um, human capital subsidies. These are all parts of something which I would simply call subsidies, aggressive subsidies to labor demand. And if this is true in the UK with a fairly educated labor force, it is twice uh, or three times more urgent in many emerging and developing countries in which the same macro imbalances are in place, but in which in addition you have a less trained and less uh, productive um, workforce. The real catch, of course, is that all of this is expensive and uh, that is a subject to which I will return at the very end. 
The other thing that needs to be ensured, of course, is that the level of aggregate demand and therefore the implied demand for labor is high. In a world of low interest rates, what else do we need to do? Well, we need um, some fiscal expenditure. And as Rain mentioned, as Adair mentioned, and of course, as, as Nick Stern has been emphasizing for a long time, the great opportunity here is a green transition with expenditure on infrastructure and the implied demand for labor. The doubt that I have here, um, and I think this is an issue, is a potential mismatch between the kinds of skills that the labor force has now and the kinds of skills that will be required in that green transition. Uh, there may be issues of the kind of work people did before. If services go down and travel agencies and pizza parlors have less demand, will those people have the skills necessary to go into this green revolution? Or as, as Tara just pointed out, there may be issues of gender, issues of age, you know, uh, in which um, the kinds of jobs that are created may, may not simply meet the skills um, that are available out there. Andre. Last but not least, and to end, there's the issue of debt, which of course will uh, make all of this very different. It is expensive and we need to find someone to pay for it. And with that, let me stop before Nick take the microphone away from me and hand it over to Diane. Thanks very much, Andres. Hello, everybody. And I'm also delighted to be taking part in this. Of course, it's always a challenge to follow so many uh, brilliant um, presentations already. So I just want to make the rather obvious point that we're at a fork in the road. And we can either now try to restore what went before imperfectly, because this is a very big crisis, or we can try to restructure the economy for the better. Now that might seem a very obvious point to make, but we've already wasted one major 21st century crisis. The, the financial crisis 2008-9 was described at the time as the biggest economic crisis in recent memory. But it's astonishing with hindsight how little changed in terms of the structure of the economy and inequality and uh, transition to clean energy and so on. So this crisis is bigger and I think rather than setting out a whole range of policies across the board, what I want to do is set out three principles that I think any policy should be aligned to so that we can align people's expectations and behavior and make sure that we are all heading down the right side of that fork in the road. So the first principle is invest like a Victorian. We are still using the physical and intangible infrastructure that was created in the late 19th century. The UK's investment record across the board, whether it's firms, physical capital, infrastructure, research and development, human capital, it's very poor. So let's make sure that in 10 years time, we have a clean energy and transport system that's going to last for 150 years. Let's invest in other advanced technologies. Let's also have the modern equivalence of that expansion of the education system, public libraries, institutions, and uh, invest in our social and natural capital as well. So that's the first principle, investment. The second is that we really have to all be in this together. The current crisis, as we've heard already, is exposing and amplifying the fault lines and inequalities in our society. Angus Deaton and Richard Blundell in their recent RES seminar set out some of those figures. So it's time to really grasp the nettle of what will be some very unpopular reforms and remedy the multiple and interconnected manifestations of inequality in our society. And that's everything from jobs and skills that we've been hearing about um, to poor broadband, poor air quality, out bad health outcomes, inadequate housing, inadequate access to green space and bus routes and so on. People say we're all in the same boat. We're obviously not really. Some of us are doing much better than others, but we are all in the same train. And no matter how fancy first class is, if the wheels are falling off the back carriages, the train's not going to go forward. The third principle is that we're going to need a new institutional settlement when we get into political economy here. I think this crisis proves beyond doubt, if anybody still thought so, that Westminster and Whitehall have all of the answers. Local information is vital. Um, we need the private and the public and the voluntary sectors to be working together with communities. The state and the market are not opposites or separate demands. We also need to think about how information is mediated. 
the press is collapsing and social media is the wild west and this is an economic issue because information determines economic choices and expectations and behavior and we're never going to get a 5g network or we're never going to get people vaccinated if that disinformation that's around there isn't tackled so you could break this into a long list of separate policy suggestions and there'll be lots that are very sensible they'll be complex and difficult and I think the key now really is to recognize that we are at that point of um, point of inflection where we choose what kind of society we want to build back and use this economic emergency and really don't let this crisis go to waste so it will be tough and it's a wrenching moment but I hope that at the end in a decade's time we end up with a fairer um, greener and pleasanter economy and I'll stop there and hand back to Tara to moderate all the questions. Thank you very much um, Diane and thank you also to all of you who have sent in through lots and lots of really important really insightful questions. Um, we won't have time to go through all of them but a broad one that seems to be repeated a theme in the questions is how do we balance um, as we come in out of the crisis mode and into the recovery mode um, investment in infrastructure and in especially in green infrastructure on one hand and investment in human capital on the other and I'm wondering if any of our panelists or respondents would like to offer some suggestions for policymakers on how to how to think about that is there a trade-off is there not a trade-off um, and how to prioritize the right things going forward okay i guess i'll need to actually pick one of you considering the fact that you know we uh we need bradley to unmute you so why don't i go to adair on that one just because Adair, you also um made some comments about the fiscal situation and how this is an opportunity to use coming out of the crisis to really rebuild the economy well funnily enough i've been thinking most about this in relation to china recently where China's classic way to re-stimulate economy is to pour concrete uh, on a massive quantity to build real estate, build uh, what they call traditional uh, infrastructure. And they've been debating about whether they should instead be building what they call new infrastructure, uh, which is, you know, IT, 5G, optical fiber, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the challenges they're struggling with is that the sheer amount of money you can spend on the latter just doesn't match uh, the amount of money uh, you can spend on the former in sheer uh, billions of pounds. And there is, there is a problem sometimes that just if we, what you want to create is jobs quickly, uh, sometimes the way to do that is to, you know, hit uh, the accelerator in terms of, you know, physical construction activity rather than other activities. But it does mean that we've got to try and make sure that if we are going to use a physical uh, construction route, uh, to a stimulus, we make that also building a physical infrastructure, and uh, Diane was talking about this, which is the infrastructure we want for future. And I think it was very interesting to see uh, the Climate Change Committee saying, should we be building more roads for the future, or should we be installing as much optical fiber uh, for the future? Both of them actually uh, require uh, quite a lot of short term labor. You know, one of them is, you know, pouring concrete or pouring tarmac, uh, but another is digging ditches and uh, rooting things along roads. So they're both relatively job intensive, but one builds for the future. I think I have less points of view maybe than others, and I, maybe Steve does, uh, on the issue of, you know, what, what is there a trade-off between human capital uh, and uh, a physical infrastructure? But I think the crucial thing is that on the physical infrastructure side, we've got to make sure that we use that not only as a macroeconomic stimulus measure, but that what we're building, what we're ending up with, is the infrastructure that we need for the clean, sustainable uh, economy of the future. Great, thank you, Adair. And maybe, Steve, you could pick up on that. Um, and adding on to Adair's question, can you think of a job creation scheme that would actually involve training and education? Because um, that might also then involve more women as well. I think, I mean, I mean there's, a number, there's a number of themes you can think about here. So, so one of the ones I mentioned in, in, in the talk was the sustainable jobs. Plenty of those could be productive jobs that would interact and could be, could be involved with infrastructure, of course. 
uh, but, but, but green infrastructure rather than uh, polluting infrastructure. Um, so that, that's one dimension. I think the trade-off in terms of human capital uh, and physical capital is, is what I meant about that really was the tradition to offer uh, tax credits on human capital is extraordinarily limited, uh, yet physical capital, especially R&D tax credits, uh, are, are, are very generous. Not, notwithstanding the fact that they've actually been relatively successful. And, and I think the, 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 and, and in terms of creating jobs, and especially jobs, jobs for women um, as well, I think there's a very, very important spatial dimension on this. Uh, and, you know, there isn't available jobs in many parts of the country. And I think something needs to be done very much about that. I think the job guarantee is hopeful for that. I think other forms of employer subsidies, but also the interaction with further education colleges. Uh, can be massively improved, and I think that would, would be, would be a, a significant benefit. It's, you know, it's been needed to be confronted for absolutely ages, and, and to be honest, I think policy is mostly ducked here. A few, a few things have been done, but it really needs to be taken head on. Uh, and in terms of you know, what, what Diane says about you know, a fairer society and stuff, th these kind of things are absolutely integral to that. And so the rebuilding in that way could be a very positive way to go forward. Great, thank you. And I'm wondering if I could hand over Rain for just a brief comment on where you think um, you know, businesses' role might be in that, and have you seen some kind of reskilling, upskilling initiatives, or heard about them in other countries that might also be valuable for the UK to learn from in this policy space? Yeah, well, well, no, and 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 look, as, as you know, Tara, we've we've done a lot of, of work uh, with McKinsey's and and others, and and yourselves around around this whole piece about adult. A lifelong learning. We know even before this crisis there was a huge need and yet our sort of policy mechanisms to deliver that probably aren't sort of well uh, designed and I think just briefly on that building on what Stephen was saying at the moment we have the apprenticeship levy I think one of the you know that really needs to change there's also a fundamental problem that if you make it a levy on employment then you're hitting some of the businesses which are very thin margin high employment businesses and you're probably getting less of the revenues from some of the digital businesses which we know are you know employ fewer people but are much more profitable uh, but actually could make a huge contribution in uh, in terms of, of digital skills. So I think there is absolutely some rethinking and, you know, countries like Singapore have some interesting models. Um, I think when we've tried to do it in the past in the UK, it hasn't worked so well. So I'd almost encourage us to start afresh, learn from the best and, and really implement something new because I think everyone sees the need. I think one of the things that we have to just on the, you know, spending on physical infrastructure is we almost have to remind ourselves where some of those companies are right now. So I think one of the challenges in the construction sector, right, is these are some of the businesses who are really highly indebted at the moment and will become more indebted as this crisis unfolds. So thinking if if physical infrastructure is the priority and particularly, I would say, retrofitting homes, digital broadband, that's what I would prioritize. How do you make sure we have the companies who can deliver that working uh, with building the skills we need to deliver that as well. Thanks very much Rain and thank you everyone so much for joining. I will now hand over to Nick for some final words. Thank you very much uh, Tara. We've had a very good session. Thank you to the speakers and discussants. We've seen the magnitude of the challenge. There is a huge risk of a global depression. We can drive out of this and driving out of it in a sustainable way can be fast, labour intensive, have strong multipliers, and it can lead us to the growth story of the future. That is uh, a story where we invest strongly in human capital, natural capital, physical capital, and are very careful also about social cohesion and social capital. And it's a very attractive story. Cities where we can move and breathe, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful, a way of life which should give much greater satisfaction in jobs and in, in all other ways of uh, living. That is what's in our hands. We can drive that in that direction through the recovery. And we've heard today policies that can take us there on capital markets, on carbon pricing, on innovation, on investing in people and labor, and real opportunities as we do that to reduce inequality across many dimensions, including across uh, men and women. So thank you so much to our speakers and discussants. Thank you to the organizers and our technicians that made it all uh, happen. And thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.